Yeah. All right, cool. So hip stability. Um, this is going to be a big thing for a lot of clients, mainly because people sit all day. So the postural muscles that we have to use to maintain proper gait cycle, which is just our walking and running cycle. Um, anything that we required, like when we bend over and pick something up, all of these systems are basically relaxing all day because we sit all day. We sit in our car, we sit at work, uh, we sit as students, we sit at a desk. Um, so the less time that we actually spend working these, and even in most programs, especially machine-based programs, you're sitting on machines, you're laying on a bench, um, you're not actually working the body as a unit in its functional way that it's meant to function um, with two feet on the floor, walking, and in a split stance. So hip stability is going to be really important to focus on with clients, and this is kind of my progression scale that I have used on pretty much all my clients um, and myself um, just to kind of start at square one, um, test, and then retest. So Again, like with the OPT model, everything builds on top of it. So what, one, what we're gonna see is there's certain principles that we have, have to apply, um, and those principles basically just get more and more drawn out to their logical conclusion. So real quick, those principles of stability, so this is stability for the shoulder, this is stability for the hip, this is ankle stability, anything like that. The more we minimize the base of support and the more we deviate the center of gravity. So as you see, we're gonna maximize the base of support at the beginning, meaning our base of support is going to be the largest. So if you think about a house, a skyscraper is on a very small base of support for how tall it is, whereas a one-story house is a very wide base of support for a very short structure. Um, so the center of gravity is gonna be, or the, the base of support being wider is going to help um, in keeping you upright and keeping you stable. And then deviation of center of gravity. If you've ever seen Michael Jackson do that thing where he like leans all the way forward, that's deviating your center of gravity. And for pretty much every human, uh, the center of gravity is about behind your belly button, but in front of your spine. So if you were to take um, something and kind of do like an MRI or something right through the belly button to about halfway uh, till it came out the back, that's where your center of gravity is. The only exception to that is extremely, extremely short people. Um, and extremely, extremely tall people. So like NBA players that are nearing seven, eight feet tall, like, um, or people with gigantism or something like that, that have a, like a thyroid or a glandular disorder where they grow super tall or don't grow very tall, their center of gravity is gonna be way off, but for most humans, it's right behind the belly button. Um, so those are just kind of the main principles. And as we go through this, I want y'all to focus on um, the main things that we're looking at here. Um, and see how we minimize the base support as we go along. So the base support gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and the center of gravity gets further and further and further away from that base of support. Okay, so again, our body stabilizes in an X pattern. Uh, I've talked about these before in the class. Um, I haven't gone into too much detail, but we basically have our posterior oblique sling and then our anterior oblique sling right here. So this posterior oblique sling, it says gluteus maximus right here. It's pretty much all the glutes. So the glute max, the glute med, the glute minimus, all that stuff. And then the latissimus dorsi. And then as well, there's um, the hamstring is included. Depending on which model and book you look at, the hamstring can be included in this as well. And then over here, it's mainly our transverse abdominis, our internal external oblique, and then our adductors on the contralateral side. So again, our body stabilizes in this X pattern. Why does it do that? Well, if you notice how when you walk, the opposite arm of the leg that goes forward, so when you're walking with your left foot forward, your right hand goes out, that's this X pattern working because the force is generated in this X pattern across the body, so these slings have to work to keep us from basically twisting up in a ball or falling apart, anything like that. Especially when we go to pick something up or when we go to do athletic movements, so running, jumping, sprinting, cutting, anything like that, these are working overtime because then our body has to take its center of gravity and rapidly shift the direction it's moving. And we don't want any strains or any um, injuries to occur there, especially at the spine. So again, I've mentioned a couple times that the lats are really responsible for stabilizing the lumbar spine more than the abs in this posterior oblique sling is why. And again, bending over and picking things up, most of the time you do that either in a split stance or it's an uneven load. So you pick up grocery bags, they're going to be heavier in one hand than they are in the other, and you have to have this uh, unilateral strength and bilateral strength in these X patterns um, 
to kind of make sure that you're, you stay healthy, you don't injure your spine, you don't slip a disc, anything like that. I'm gonna move on here. So again, we wanna load these in a way to train these systems. Now I've mentioned a couple times how we can do this through other exercises. So split stance rows, single arm bench press, um, lunge and overhead press, all those different things. So if we're lunging forward, let's say we have our left foot up in the lunge and then we're pressing a dumbbell with our right hand, that is a, an X force or a cross line force um, that we're forced to stabilize through. So it's gonna work this posterior and oblique sling. So again, the more we can put ourselves into the position to require this stability to work, the more stability and strength we're gonna get, gain through our core, the more stable our spine and our hips are gonna be. Um, and then the more we can load, because if you have an unstable surface, you can't really load that much. So if we go and we have very weak and unstable posterior and anterior oblique sling, and we try to squat, uh, we're not going to be able to squat as much because our body's not going to let us because our spine is going to be unstable. So this is the first one. Um, if you want to take notes on this, go ahead. Um, each one of these is going to be loaded in a different way. Some of them are going to be only body weight. So this first one is a low lateral box step up and it's only body weight. We don't want this box to be very big. We want it to be six inches at most off the ground. So about curb height. Um, and what we wanna do is have the client, I kinda take this step one out and basically have the client start with their foot on the box and then flex their um, leg all the way up so it's extended, sorry about that. Um, flex it all the way up so it's extended um, and then they gotta stabilize this way and then slowly lower themselves back down to where their foot lightly touches the ground and then back up. This is the most regressed version and if during your initial consultation you find that they have very poor hip stability, um, this is where you would start. If they really can't stand up without grabbing onto the wall or anything like that, you would want to start here, um, especially if they have some sort of issue where they can only, if, if you get a client that only squats to about a quarter to half depth, you want to start here because um, they're most likely not going to be able to properly hinge at the hips. Um, but here's the best way. Um, what we don't want to have happen is we don't want them to crash down on this foot. So what we want is them to very lightly, um, we want them to very lightly um, touch their toe. So keeping the weight on the foot that's on the box the whole time, the more they have to stabilize. So we want them to get all the way up to here, and then we want them to very slowly control it back down to where they just lightly tap their toe on the ground. We don't want any like crashing or shifting of weight. We wanna keep all the weight on this leg. So that's our first um, thing. Again, there's no loading here. We're pretty much always gonna do this body weight. So we're pretty much always going to do this body weight. Um, and then once we're comfortable here, once we get to about a six inch box, if you want to go up higher to like an eight inch box, you can. Um, then you kind of get into more of like a quad loading pattern and it's a lot harder to maintain down. Um, but once you get up to a six inch box, I say you can progress on to the next step. So that next step is going to be a stationary lunge. So we're not walking at all. We're keeping our feet planted on the floor in this split stance. So um, again, going back to our principles, this is where we start to see that base of support. So with that first one, we're only on one foot, but we're not deviating the center of gravity really much at all. It's staying right over um, that foot and it's only going about six inches up and down. So it's a very, very shallow range of motion. So we can deal with that one foot, very minimal base support. Here is where we start to deviate the center of gravity a lot more. So we wanna maximize that base of support in this regressed version. So we're gonna body weight lunge, um, keep your feet planted the whole time. You're gonna start body weight, move to a contralateral load. So a contralateral load is going to be opposite of the foot that's forward. So see right here, he's got um, his right foot forward and the weight is in his left hand. So he's again loading in that X pattern. Now again, we're gonna move on from there to an ipsilateral load, which is the same. So again, he's got his right leg forward and the load is now in his right hand. So um, we can do overhead. We don't really wanna do that unless they have the adequate shoulder stability. But again, I would rather stop at ipsilateral load and move on to the next step rather than try to progress all the way to overhead. I would just work on shoulder stability separately and use overhead as a totally separate stimulus. So again, the deviation of the center of gravity gets a lot more. It's very minimal um, with a body weight lunge. It's again, right behind our belly button. But as we add this weight in a contralateral load, it starts to shift more 
over towards the side so that deviation of the center of gravity from that base support gets a little bit more lateral. And then again, same here. Now it's more shifted all the way over to the right. So we have to stabilize even more through this side of the core to keep us being pulled down towards that weight. So it's still an X pattern. It's just a little bit more complicated X pattern. This loading, this contralateral loading is going to be the most functional, meaning that this is the loading pattern that our body experiences when we're in gait cycles. So running, sprinting, walking, anything like that. This is the loading pattern, this contralateral load. That's going to be what we see. This ipsilateral